I want to read you a story. One I read as a, as a young man in the mountains of Northern California, mining gold with my dad. That was his, his summer hobby. And we didn't have the internet. We didn't even have cell phones back then. But we had books. And this book series left such an impression on me that when it came to domestication of the horse, this story has always stuck with me. Now, to set the scene, we talked about equus, all the different species. So this is the, the last recent ice age, the height of it, you know, maybe 30,000 years ago. At the base of these ice sheets were valleys, and the valleys were, were fruitful. They were, they were full of animals, full of life, full of plants, full of trees, but also the plains, uh, lots of grasslands, horses. Equus ferris, the, the, the wild horse at the time, was doing extremely well. And humans were living next to Neanderthals. And Aya was a young woman surviving by herself with her equid companion that she had raised since she was a little foal. Here, we pick up the story. She drew in her breath, pursed her lips, and concentrating on it, let out a long, solid whistle. Winnie tossed her head, whinnied, and pranced to her. Aya stood up and hugged the horse's neck, suddenly realizing how much she had grown. You're so big, Winnie. Horses grow so fast. You're almost a grown woman horse. How fast can you run now? Aya gave her a sharp slap on the rump. Come on, Winnie. Run with me. She motioned, starting across the field as fast as she could. The horse outdistanced in a few paces and raced ahead, stretching out as she galloped. Aya followed her, running just because it felt good. She pushed herself until she could go no further, panting to a breathless halt. She watched the horse gallop down the long valley, then veer around in a wide circle and come cantering back. I wish I could run like you, she thought. Then we could both run together, wherever we wanted. I wonder if I'd be happier if I were a horse instead of a human. I wouldn't be alone then. I'm not alone. Winnie's good company, even if she isn't human. She's all I have, and I'm all she has. But wouldn't it be wonderful I could run like her? The filly was lathered when she returned and made Aya laugh when she rolled in the meadow, kicking her legs up in the air and making little noises of pleasure. When she got up, she shook herself and went back to grazing. Aya kept watching her, thinking how exciting it would be to run like a horse, then fell to practicing her whistle again. The next time she managed a shrill, piercing sound. Winnie looked up and cantered to her again. Aya hugged the young horse, rather pleased that she'd come at the whistle, but she couldn't get thought of running with the horse out of her mind. Then an idea struck her. Such an idea would not have occurred to her if she hadn't lived with the animal all winter, thinking of her as a friend and companion. And certainly she would not have acted on such a thought if she were still living with the clan. But Aya had become more used to following her impulses. Would she mind? Aya thought. Would she let me? She led the horse to a log and climbed up on it, then put her arms around the horse's neck and lifted a leg. Run with me, Winnie. Run and take me with you, she thought, then straddled the horse. The young mare was unaccustomed to wait on her back, and she flattened her ears back and pranced nervously. But, though the weight was unfamiliar, the woman was not, and Aya's arms around her neck had a calming influence. Winnie almost reared to throw the weight off, then tried to run away from it instead. Breaking into a gallop, she raced down the field with Aya clinging to her back. But the young horse had already had a good run, and life for her in the cave was more sedentary than was usual. Though she had grazed the standing hay of the valley, she hadn't had a herd to keep up with or predators to run from, and she was still young. It wasn't long before she slowed, then stopped, her sides heaving and her head drooping. The woman slid off the horse's back. Winnie, that was wonderful, Aya motioned, her eyes sparkled with excitement. She lifted the droopy muzzle with both hands and laid her cheek on the animal's nose. Then she tucked the mare's hand under her arm in a gesture of affection, which she hadn't used since the horse was small. It was a special embrace, saved for special occasions. The ride was a thrill she could hardly contain. 
The very idea of going along with a horse when it galloped filled Aya with a sense of wonder. She had never dreamed such a thing was possible. No one had. That was a passage from The Valley of Horses by Jean M. All, and some of you might have recognized that or recognized the story. Uh, the first book, Clan of the Cave Bear, and part of the Earth's Children series, just one that that made a huge impact on me as a young adult. And just I, I, I just go back to that scene when I I think of the first human to jump on the back of a horse and it made me think it had to be something similar like that, possibly, where the horse was raised by humans. Uh, from a young age where there was some sort of trust or it could have been the animal was more tame and somebody decided to hop on the back to see what would happen and how long they could hold on or how long, how far they went, all of those thoughts. That happened in history at some point. Somebody was the first to do that. And that series, I think uh, that that book passage, I, I really believe, brings that out. As we mentioned in the first episode, when we domesticated the horse, everything changed for us. Humanity changed. It changed your life, even though you may not even work with horses or have ever touched a horse in your life. It did. It changed everything. So it's interesting to study the process of of how this happened and when it happened. And that is what this episode is going to tell us. And it also goes into why care about this topic? Because again, understanding their history, understanding the process as of domestication, it makes your connection to the horse that much stronger and you understand the process. And then you can look at your horse and go, wow, I know your history. I see you. I know you. Or you can look at your donkey. Or if you have a hybrid, a mule, you, you can connect to them and go, Wow, I get it now. And that's why we talk about it, because their history is so tied up into their behaviors, their physiology, their identity as domestic horses, donkeys, or mules. And the other important aspect of this is I read this quote in a a previous podcast where the authors said the domestication of the horse about 5,500 years ago represents one of the most important technological innovations in the ancient world. And I argued there's really nothing sense that can trump that because without that, you know, me at fire, fire, probably the humans discovering fire. Sure. That probably trumps horses by a a nudge. I'll give it a nudge. I'll, I'll say, okay. But I would still argue that once horses were domesticated, it changed everything. It changed the game. It changed our trajectory. So again, another reason to, to why care. And what I found particularly interesting in doing the research, reading the recent papers, scientific publications, and an aspect I never really thought about, but for many of you listening, uh, speaking English, not only just our genetics, but languages, that we can trace the spread of horses in spreading the Indo-European languages around the planet. And this dates back thousands of years. So our individual cultures, whether you're you're European, Asian, African, uh, Pacifica, uh, here I'm living in New Zealand, all have been directly impacted by the domestication of horses. So telling their story also tells us a little bit about ourselves. Before we get going, I, I, there's just a couple terms I, I, I want to explain out there. Because we, we use the term wild, and then we use the term feral. And when it comes to horses, wild animals or true wild horses are animals that their natural state have been without human interference or selective breeding. Of all the horses left, Przewalski horses are considered wild. Now, there is a little debate on that, and we're going to get into it in this podcast because 
some of the evidence of early domestication talks about Przewalski horses, and it, and it's really interesting. I'm going to get there in a minute, but without horses, if we go into the non cabaline we talked about the wild asses and the zebras. Zebras are obviously wild. They have been tamed. People have tamed them, but they were not domesticated. Now, the wild horses, say, in the Western United States or the massive herds in Australia or other parts of the world that we call wild horses are not, quote unquote, truly wild because they have been domesticated for thousands of years, selectively bred to be domestic and tame and all of these things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch upon it here just after I finish this point what that means, what domestication means. They're really feral. So they were de- feral animals are ones that were domesticated, but have reverted to their quote unquote wild state. And, you know, we could say it's semantics, but when you really dig into it, it, it makes sense. And, and we'll talk more about that later. But in the United States today, you can adopt Mustangs, wild horses, and they can be trained and ridden relatively easily because of that generation after generation of breeding that they still have that in their genetics. The true Equus wild horse no longer ex- exists. Now, the final piece of this is, is tame, what it means to tame an animal. And these are wild animals that are habituated to humans or trained to be habituated to humans, or, or they're tolerant to us. You know, the, the presence of us, they don't flee uh, like any wild animal normally does. But they are still wild and they can revert to their wild state relatively easily. Uh, like I said, zebras have been tamed. Asian elephants are not domestic. They have been tamed to work with humans. So in parts of Asia, they were working for a while. Now, the, the process of domestication and, and going to try to make this as, as tangible or as, or as easily digestible as possible because it is very complex and it's a very long process taking over, you know, it takes many, many generations to domesticate any species. And to give the specific definition Quote, to adapt an animal or plant, because plants can be domesticated, over time from a wild or natural state, especially by selective breeding, to life in close association with and to the benefit of humans. Now, anthropologists have said that the domestication of animals and plants is one of the most important advancements of our species. As as I've been saying from the start, they rank it up there with fire tool use, languages, it has been that important to us and has changed our history so deeply that it, 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 it's so important to understand. And this is especially true with our relationship of the horse. Now, like I said, domestication is complex. So I, there is a study, and, and some scientists have said this is one of the most important scientific studies conducted in the 20th century, and it's the classical study of the silver fox. And I'm going to quickly summarize this study. And the reason I'm bringing up the silver fox in a horse podcast is because this study demonstrates how wild animals have been domesticated and why our horses and donkeys look like the way they do and behave the way they do. Because this study has given us so much insight into the process of domestication that we can infer and go, okay, well, for this animal, it probably looks like this. And that's why I, I, I love to bring up this study. And for over 60 years, a team of, of Russian geneticists have been running this experiment through the 20th century into the 21st century. The, the experiments are continuing and going on now, especially with genetics. We, we, we're learning so much more. And to summarize all of this, 
the the two major scientists that they started this in the Soviet Union back in 1959, and it was the brainchild of Dmitry Balayev. But really, Ludmila Trut, she is the lead researcher to this day. She's still working on it. In her, she's in her 80s. She's an incredible scientist. She has given us so much understanding into animal behavior and god i would love it's like somebody i would love to meet one day one of, one of my idols when i when i've read what she's done and the research she's done and how they were almost shut down in the 60s and they kept going and kept going but they have shown how to domesticate the silver fox so in this study they they, they started with wild s- silver foxes and They hypothesize that in the early stages of of all animal domestication, that early humans, like with the horse, must have chose the calmest and most pro-social animal towards humans. So they, they, they called it tameness. So if you had 10 silver foxes, they would choose the ones that were the least aggressive, the less stressed the ones that were the nicest to them. So you can imagine the very early on, most of them were, were freaked out, scared of people, running away. But the ones that, that weren't quite, bleh, you know, kind of tentative, those are the ones they bred. So you can imagine with our wild horses, the ones that were selected to be domesticated were probably the ones that were less flighty, right? Or less aggressive. And what they started to do is breed them. The reason the silver fox was such a good subject animal is because their generational interval is only one year. So they produce kits year after year after year, and then within a year, their, their babies can breed because they, they have shorter lifespans. And the generational interval is defined as the average age of the parents at birth of their offspring that in turn will produce the next generation of breeding animals. So in contrast to a yearly generational interval of silver foxes, and I think like mice and rodents, it's really short. It's like weeks. A silver fox is a year. The horse, it's about 10 years. Humans today were about 30 years. On average today, people are having kids in their late 20s, early 30s. Now, what they did is is year after year, taking the the most tame, the ones with the, the, the least aggressive, they started to produce a subset of foxes. And within six generations, so just within six years, they had silver foxes that would lick the hand of the the experimenters or the scientists. You could pick them up. You could pet them. They they whined whenever the humans walked away. They wagged their tails when humans approached. So if we looked at just within six generations, they're still not domesticated, but they're starting to show these behaviors that we see, say, in dogs today. Uh, So if we applied that to horses, so six generations of horses to get to a state where, you know, they'd whinny at us or nuzzle us or show some sort of connection, that alone would take 60 years. And if we go back thousands of years, the human generational interval, I looked this up, used to be 25 years. So today it's 30, 5,000 years ago, uh, mid to early 20s is when most humans had babies. Humans only lived to be about 40. So that was their average lifespan. So if it took 60 years to produce somewhat tame horses, that's over two to three human generations. So going back to my first words in this podcast, the spoken word, that knowledge of how to train or select or breed horses had to be passed on to their children and then their grandchildren, because this is such a long process. And back 5,500 years ago, 6,000 years ago, they didn't have writing utensils or they didn't write things down. It was all word of mouth. Now, to speed this up, the silver foxes, within a decade, scientists noticed, so this is 10 generations of silver foxes, their physiology started to to change. Their ears started getting floppy, and they started to get curly tails. 
So that started to change. And that was a hundred years. That would take 10, 10 generations in a horse is a hundred years to start seeing physical changes in the body. Then by 15 generations, so 150 years in horses, but in, the, in these foxes, 15 years, 15 generations, their stress hormones were less around people or being handled. And they actually noticed their adrenal glands were smaller. So they had a, a, a less quick stress response, fight or flight. We'll talk about that in behavior one day. And they also noticed their nervous systems were changing too, but th that's getting really into the science. Then it was by generation 40 when they considered that these foxes were fully domesticated. So 40 years in the silver fox, that would be 400 years in the horse. And other physical traits changed. Their coat colors were changing. They, they called it mutt-like fur patterns. They, they just started looking like dogs. And so what that means for the horse is, is 40 generations, 400 years. So it took at least 10 generations of humans to fully domesticate horses. And it it's probably took longer. That's, this is in a, in a controlled, modern, scientific study where if we go back, you know, four or 5,000 years ago, you know, it could have taken longer. The other aspect of this is, is you're talking a fox is a predator, horses are a herbivore. There could be some differences there, but it gives us so much insight into how long this took. It wasn't just within two or three breeding cycles or, or generations you have a domestic horse. It took hundreds and hundreds of years for this to happen. And again, that's why this story is so fascinating. So where do we start with our today's horses? I know last week with the rise of Equus, we were talking about Hagerman's horse gave way to all of the horses we have today. All domestic horses trace their lineage back to Equus ferris. This was the wild horse. Kind of, scientists think it kind of looked like the Brzezowski horse, but darker coat pattern, so not so done maybe darker, you know, brown, black, uh, but they did go extinct because we've taken them out of the wild and domesticated them. Now there are other, the other wild types, the Brzezowski horse is still around. And then the tarpon, I'm not really going to talk about them too much in this podcast, but they went extinct in 1909. That was the other wild horse that was a separate species. Now science, science is, is detective work. It, it takes a lot to do these studies. What I love about the field of science is it's full of debate. Things are constantly evolving and changing. One study, and, and I've, I used to teach this to my students, one study is not a truth. You need to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. I was just thinking of an example, like here I live in New Zealand. Let's say I go find a plant. I feed it to somebody that has cancer and it, it, it cures them. And I say, I've cured cancer and it's this plant. Well, other scientists need to go in and, and take that plant extract or whatever it is and, and do multiple studies. And unless they can confirm what I found, my study will be dismissed, right? One study does not make a truth. So it's important to remember that. Now, the study of domestication in the horse has fascinated people because it was so important to us. The general consensus was... And this is going to change, so I don't need to spend a lot of time on it. But the, about a decade ago, everybody thought, okay, for sure, this is where horses were first domesticated. And that was the Botai peoples of northern Kazakhstan. It's Central Asia, just south of Central Russia, Kazakhstan is. The Botai peoples were hunter-gatherers, and then they all of a sudden turned into a sedentary people. They had settlements. They, horse meat was a major source of their diet. And 5,500 years ago, there was a lot of horse bones. There was, they were surrounded by horses. And it is thought this is where domestication happened because of some evidence. They, they had some structures to, to hold animals. So it was thought those were possibly to hold horses. So that's important. 
means you're not a nomadic lifestyle. It means you're a settlement and you had these pens and they're thinking, oh, okay, that's probably where they might've held horses. But there was plenty of evidence that horses were hunted and eaten. And there was just these bits of evidence that, okay, you add this all up and it looks like, aha, this is where horses were domesticated. And this study that was released in 2009, the earliest horse harnessing and milking, this was a multi-agency study, multiple countries, scientists from all over the world, the US, UK, France, Russia. and they basically said this is where horses were domesticated. One of their biggest pieces of evidence was some bit wear on a tooth of a stallion. Now, what does that mean? Well, for anybody that's been around horses, or even if you haven't, the bridle is what we put on the horse's head with a bit in their mouth to control them, to ride them. You have the head stall, which goes around the horse's ears and the pole and forehead, and is connected down to the bit in the mouth of the horse. Today, they're mainly metal. Uh, They rest, the bit rests on the bars of the horse's mouth. So the horses have front incisors and then they have a bunch of gums. That's the bars. And then they have their back molars. So that's where the bit normally rests. Now with bitted horses, there is some wear on their teeth. And so this bow tie stallion's lower second premolar had some band of bit wear in the cementum and enamel of the tooth. So they're saying there was definitely a bit in the mouth. This is where you would normally see it. And it probably wasn't metal. It it was probably hard leather or something like that. Um, But that was some interesting evidence. And then they paired it up with milk fats on pottery. Now, you can't milk a wild horse. There's no way. I have milked mares before. When we're, we do colostrum checks for full health right after birth, I've milked mares. It's not an easy process. She has to stand there. It takes a long time. It's not like milking a cow. It, 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 you have to be patient, and hopefully the mare's patient. A wild or even somewhat tame horse is probably not going to let you do it. They might, but I don't know. It, it, it's It's very difficult. So what these scientists have found in in pottery that have survived through the ages these last 5000 years they've they've found some degraded animal fat and through analytical chemistry they're able to identify and say okay those are probably horse milk fats not horse meat fat but milk fats that's what they were trying to argue well about 10 years goes by and everything gets thrown on its head Because of genetics. And like I said, genetics is changing everything. And our understanding of the natural world, our understanding of horses. So a study was released in 2018. This was a study of over 46 authors, which means it's massive. It was published in science. This is a major undertaking. And the title is Ancient Genomes Revisit the Ancestry of Domestic and Przewalski's Horses. This initial study with the Bowtie people supposed they were Equus ferris, Equus ferris. This study comes in and says, in fact, we've studied the bones, we've gotten DNA, because this is only 5,000 years ago. We're not talking millions of years with fossilization. These are bones in the soil that eventually will degrade, but they were able to dig up bones, identify that this was, in fact, Przewalski horses. And everybody's like, okay, these, this wasn't Equus ferris. This wasn't wild horses. These are Przewalski horses. And so now everybody's like, okay, well, they must have domesticated Przewalski horses, and then they went loose, and they're feral. And so that means Przewalski horses are, are not true wild horses anymore. They're actually just feral horses. So that was thrown in there. And then it was like, well, Przewalski horses behavior doesn't, they're very difficult to tame. And uh, people that I know that have worked with them, they're, they're, they're wild. They, they've got those wild genes in them. Also looking at our domestic horses, today's domestic horses only have about 2.7% of DNA from bow tie horses or Przewalski horses. So 
not a big portion of domestication. So what that possibly means is Przewalski horses were tamed to be milked, maybe ridden, or uh, I'm going to tell this story here in a second because we don't know. And it, it, it asks the question, are Przewalski horses really wild or not? There's still debate going on, and, and, and I think I'm on the side that Przewalski horses are somewhat wild. Uh, I will say all the Przewalski horses that we have today left in the world, there's about 2,000. They were all under human care, meaning, you know, 50 years ago, they were extinct in the wild. So they've been handled by humans. They've been, I would say, selectively bred, but not for tameness. It was more for genetic diversity for what was left. So their, their wild genes are probably still in them. And, and I would argue that they're still, quote unquote, wild. But we'll see. DNA will, will, will show that over time. The reason I say that is because this one of those latest papers titled Rethinking the Evidence for Early Horse Domestication at Bowtie really puts a damper on the bowtie evidence. And one of the reasons is because one sign of domestication, especially with the herbivore like horses, is a sex ratio, meaning you should have lots of females with a few males. Much like we breed horses today is how we've been breeding horses for thousands of years. You don't have 10 stallions and 10 mares. You have one or two really good stallions with 10 mares, right? That's, that's today or even hundreds of mares. In my graduate studies, we had 50 mares and we had like four stallions. So it, it just depends on where you're at. In bow tie, they have a one-to-one -one sex ratio, meaning... They had one male, one female. So that is actually a, a strike against them being domesticated because you would think they, they, I don't know if they were gelding and, you know, back in the day, I, I don't think they were. They probably would have eaten the males when they were younger, kept a few stallions around. They're finding older males with older females, and that would suggest hunting. They're out hunting them, bringing them in. This study... Uh, rethinking the evidence also argues that bit wear on the teeth is actually, it, that can happen to any animal. Horses, there are wild horses that get wear on their teeth like that. That doesn't necessarily mean it was a bit. Yes, if it has a, a bit, it does wear on the teeth. But one tooth from one stallion dated 5,500 years ago does not necessarily mean that that horse had a bit in its mouth. It could have just had natural wear and tear. And that just what it looked like the the bones of the bowtie horses, the backbones, the vertebrae, show no wear and tear that you see with carrying loads or pulling carts or anything like that. They don't find that evidence in the bowtie horses where you do in other places where we have found domestic horses or where horses were domesticated. There was also, like I said, a lot of evidence for arrowhead damage to bones and things like that. So, they do, like I said, this is what's so great about science. They do argue away a lot of the evidence saying, you know what? I, the evidence isn't that strong. So then in my head, I'm like, okay, what about the milk fats? That's pretty rare. You can't milk a wild mare. You just a wild horse. You can't do it. But <laughs> interestingly enough, the human remains from Bowtie have shown no evidence for dietary milk proteins. So we get dental calculus on our teeth drinking milk, and they don't find that with those peoples. So those milk fats they found could have been uh, animal fat, that they were just, it has a similar profile to, to milk fats, but it's not. So is, were the horses domesticated in bow tie? Probably not. It, it, it probably wasn't. So that means we still don't have a clear picture, but we do have a good inclination of where horses were first domesticated. So now that bow tie has been kind of eliminated as a, as a strong contender, we look elsewhere. And what the scientists today are studying is, is, is you can really study human history, human migration patterns, and that gives you an idea. Hmm, 
how did they do it? And the one that they look at is the Yamnaya culture that were pastoral, meaning they, they had herds of, herds of animals, on the Pontic Caspian steppe, so modern-day Ukraine. About 5,000 years ago, there was this massive migration of these peoples and this Indo-European languages, all of these things started to uh, leak into Andalusia and, and like, you know, you're going into modern day Southwestern Asia, up into Europe, down into Africa, Egypt, that route, down into Southeast Asia, China, Mongolia, up into Siberia. One of the things they, they, they do, and that's why I brought up linguistics, because they talk about that, the spread of languages is, is one way to trace human migration. And I'm not a linguistics expert, but, you know, it got me thinking, yeah, I mean, I, here I am living in New Zealand and, and we speak English because the England, the British settled here and we do have uh, Te Reo, so our Maori language. Uh, is is making a comeback, but English is still a, a part of our everyday life here, as it is throughout the world, as we speak in English pod, podcast. But it's just is really interesting. And then the other aspect is is all the other pieces of evidence. So if we go and look at sex ratios with adult horses, so we want more females, less males, in older horses, settlements with pens that could hold horses, bit wear in the teeth. Wear and tear on the vertebrae of horses, meaning they were carrying loads on their back, most likely people. Milk diets in humans, because horse milk is, is still drank today and in many parts of the world, it's very high in vitamin C, so it helps fight scurvy. Uh, and then also evidence in, in human remains, changes in our hips and our backs from riding. Anybody that's ridden a horse, like I, I've talked about in, in another podcast, it changes our physiology and it changes our bone structure. So if you ride a lot, you're getting changes in your hips and your, your back. That will carry on into your skeleton. So we find that in people that have ridden horses. When it comes to genetics, that is a big one that is showing that this region really is with the start of domestication. And we it, it, the evidence from 2200 BC, so 40... 200 years ago is very, very strong that these horses that were domesticated in this region were the forerunners for most of our domestic horses today in the world. So we were able to, to see the spread of genetics outward from there. A study in nature, uh, the origins and spreads of domestic horses from the Western Eurasian steppe talks about these, these horses how their genetics have spread. So it's like I was thinking about it, to, to put it into perspective for you, Ancestry.com. I've run my genetics on there. There's other human genome websites where I've traced my ancestors back you know, to the US, to, to Europe. That is what we're doing with horses, right? So these, this DNA goes back, they're, they're estimating domestication is anywhere from 4,600 years ago to 5,500 years ago. And then by 2200 BC, so 4,200 years ago, you had this massive explosion across the, the Eurasian steppe where we see these genetics spreading. Now, remember, it took hundreds of years to get to a domestic horse. So, obviously, they had domesticated them, used them in, in, their, uh, in that part of the world. And, not, and we're not talking a small region. I mean, we're talking you know, hundreds, thousand square miles. It's, it's a massive region spreading out throughout the world, into Europe, other parts of Asia, down into possibly... Egypt. And that's where we are today. So in 2023, our understanding of where horses were domesticated, we have an idea of where. Now scientists are really trying to dig down to go, okay, when? When is the exact time? And, and genetics are starting to narrow that time frame down where it's still within 6,000 years is when we really believe horses were first domesticated 
and the world has never been the same since. The other piece of this story that is less clear because they are overlooked, and that's the donkeys. That's why I always bring them up. Can't forget about them. They're that important. The The fun part about this is they were de- being domesticated almost simultaneously while horses were being domesticated in two separate parts of the world. So it was about 7,000 years ago when donkeys were starting to be tamed, the wild asses of East Africa. In Kenya, Horn of Africa, Somali wild ass, that is our original donkeys. By 5,000, 5,500 years ago, donkeys were pretty much domesticated. They were traded uh, as commodities into Egypt and then down into other parts of Africa. And then within 2,500 years, so about 500 to 1,000 BC, so 2,000 years ago, roughly, they were starting to spread throughout Europe and Asia, where they were developed into all these different breeds. And and we're going to talk about breeds of horses and donkeys and their origination of them. Uh, But we have found archaeological remains of donkeys that date back almost 7,000 years in different parts of Egypt and then different parts into, like I said, the cradle of civilization, Southwestern Asia. So donkeys were a a big, big part of that. And then mules, we find mules thousands of years ago. They were the cross of donkeys and horses. Okay. To finish this all up, because I could talk all day about this, uh, other advancements in equids and horses is again bridles were very important early on but most for thousands of years most rode the horses either bareback or with a blanket on the backs of them they didn't have saddles saddles didn't come much later in fact there were chariots being pulled by horses about four thousand years ago Saddles didn't come into the picture until about 2,700 years ago. So the early riders of horses, they they had some sort of uh, control on the head with a bridle, but the archaeological evidence for saddles was first with the Assyrian cavalry in 700 BCE, very warlike people, and that gave them a huge edge in warfare when they had saddles. But yet, no stirrups. So anybody that that rides, you know, uh, when you when you ride bareback with a bridle, it, you've got to be an, an amazing equestrian. Control with your legs, your seat's got to be great. So the, I could just imagine for thousands of years how good these riders were. And stirrups are are, are kind of a kind of crutch. Uh, I use them. I'm, I'm not afraid to say that. I feel much more comfortable with stirrups. I'm sure most people do, but they didn't come around till about 200 BCE. So that's 2,200 years ago. And that was found in India with, it was, it was like, you just stuck your toes in it. It was, it was this really crude stirrup. So it wasn't until the, about 200 AD. So we're talking 1800 years ago uh, in China, in Mongolia, evidence of stirrups that give you much more control in the saddle. So Mongolian archers of the day, they could stand up and stand in their saddles and, and do what they do. So hunt and, and warfare, things like that. So really, really interesting. So even if I go back and, and I'm, I like history, obviously, I think of the movie Gladiator, any Greek movies, Troy, all of these movies, if you see, if you see them riding horses with stirrups, you're like, that's factually incorrect. They did not have stirrups. The Roman cavalry never had stirrups until much later. Greek cavalry never had stirrups, uh, things like that. So you can dork out with that. But uh, all of this, there's so much more to learn about it. You know, when did this process exactly happen? We're studying. And then you start thinking, one of the things I got really nerdy about was the history of coat colors and people selecting they were selecting for specific coat colors specifically chestnut black and silver back 4000 years ago 
it's amazing. So when we finally, you know, get to a coat color podcast, we'll, we'll talk about that a little, little bit. My favorite personal is blue Roan, but we'll, we'll save that, uh, for one day. And just to summarize everything with domestication of Equus ferris, they, they became Equus cabalis. So our modern day horses. And I just always in your mind, I just want to leave you with this as I opened. Think about that first human. It, it could have been 30,000 years ago, like Aya. It could have been 100,000 years ago. We don't know. But somebody, somewhere, the cold wind was blowing in their face because it, Arctic blasts and they just took a leap of faith and jumped on the back of that horse and held on to that mane. And I'm, I'm hoping they didn't hurt themselves, but I imagine the exhilaration they felt with that animal running under them. That happened, and every day we're getting closer to finding out exactly where and exactly when. Wow. Okay. That one ran long. Uh, the, uh, I was waiting to get to domestication. I just, I've been reading research paper after research paper to update my knowledge in that area. And it just is such a fascinating topic. And I hope you enjoyed that podcast. It just, in the, again, the history, we're starting with the history. We're going to start going next week into where our horses are, who they are. Then we'll start breaking down what it's like to be a horse. Uh, and then we'll throw some other, I'll go back to history every now and then, history of certain breeds, history of coat colors, anything that, that comes across my desk that, that's fascinating that I think you'll find fascinating. We'll do a podcast on it. Real quick, thank you if, for those that have subscribed. If, if you don't mind, please subscribe. Give it a few more episodes before you rate us. I, I always like to wait till you get about 10 episodes in. Then, you know, I'll ask you if you can kindly uh, give us a five-star rating. But, you know, right now, just, you know, please, any feedback, podcast at madbarn.com. You can find me on social media, just on Instagram, madbarn, Facebook, look for madbarn, or you can email us. And I just want to remind you that at madbarn.com, you can go on, look at our articles we're over 400 now the the pace uh, with all the phds and dvms we have and masters uh, students and and graduates on there writing pushing out science every day again really our philosophy is this information needs to get out to the masses and we're doing it as fast as we can watch that space there are other things in development that I can't announce yet until we, we get it all ironed out. But I just want to thank you so much for listening and just stay tuned for the next episode. <laughs>